In today's brief, we'll talk about progress in the counteroffensive, Reactor 4, and the truth about the Olenivka massacre. I'm Linnea, and today is Wednesday, July 26, 2023. You're listening to the Ukraine War Brief podcast, where we bring you up to speed on the war in Ukraine in about 20 minutes or less. For no particularly good reason yesterday, I accidentally published unedited audio instead of a finished episode. The error has now been corrected, and we hope you enjoyed the unintended behind-the-scenes special. Thank you for your understanding. Let's get started with the news from Ukraine from the front. Russian forces have retreated from their positions in Andreevka, south of Bakhmut in Donetsk Oblast, according to the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, or GSAFU. Donetsk Oblast Governor Pavlo Kirilenko reported that Ukrainian forces had entered the village, but fighting continued in the vicinity. Earlier in July, Russian forces were pushed out of their positions near Orikhovo Vasilivka. They attempted a counterattack in the area, but were unsuccessful. Ukrainian forces were also able to advance in the direction of Staromayorska. According to Ukrainian military spokesman Colonel Serhi Chedavati, conditions are being set to drive Russian forces out of Bakhmut. The GSAFU reported on the 25th that in the previous 24 hours, Ukrainian forces had killed 600 occupation troops and destroyed 30 artillery systems, 13 armored combat vehicles, and 14 UAVs. The day before, Ukrainian forces reportedly killed 660 Russian soldiers and destroyed 11 tanks, 13 armored personnel carriers, 17 artillery systems, and an air defense system. Russian losses are, at this point, unsustainable, and the loss of artillery systems is particularly devastating. Colonel Yevgeny Vashinin, commander of Russia's Leningrad Regiment, which is formed primarily of conscripts from St. Petersburg, died from wounds acquired in Ukraine on July 14th. Apparently, the Leningrad Regiment had attempted to rescue a Russian Storm Z unit that had become encircled, and it didn't go well. Ukraine's Special Operations Forces Aerial Reconnaissance Unit tracked down a Russian triad electronic warfare station near Bakhmut, and Ukrainian artillery destroyed it, along with eight other targets, including artillery pieces and armored vehicles. The Ukrainian 38th Separate Marine Brigade reportedly destroyed a Russian Ka-52 Alligator attack helicopter using a man-portable air defense system called a manpad on the morning of July 25th. Russian forces have spent weeks trying to recover ground on the islands around the Ukrainian bridgehead across the Dnipro River, but the counterattacks were reportedly predictable and resulted in substantial losses. Ukrainian fighters claimed they'd eliminated multiple commanders, which was ultimately substantiated by a short interview clip published by Russian sources in which a Russian soldier confirmed that his platoon— company, and battalion commanders had been killed in Ukrainian strikes on command posts. Russian analysts assessed that the bridgehead was too far from the main Russian base, and opportunities for Russian troops to attack were limited. It was reportedly so bad that the analysts forgot to be mad about the news of the retreat. Moving on to the home front, Donetsk Oblast Governor Kirilenko reported that Russian forces attacked Kostyantinivka with cluster munitions that Russia continues to deny using, killing two children and injuring at least five people, including two more children. Two people were killed in Tokarivka during attacks on Kherson Oblast in the afternoon of the 25th, according to Kherson Oblast Governor Oleksandr Prokudin. Russian forces shelled communities in the Sumy Oblast, firing over a hundred rounds at Bilopilia, Krasnopilia, Khotin, Yunakivka, Velika Pisarivka, Nova, Sloboda, and Seredina Buda on July 24th. There were no reports of casualties at the time of recording. In its July 25th intelligence report, the UK Defense Ministry noted that Russia appears to be showing less restraint in striking Odessa and other areas in the southern parts of Ukraine, 
ever since the expiration of the Black Sea Grain Initiative, saying, quote, Between August 2022 and June 2023, when the Black Sea Grain Initiative was still in force, Russia generally refrained from striking civilian infrastructure in the southern ports. Since Russia failed to renew the deal, the Kremlin likely feels less politically constrained and is attempting to strike targets in Odessa because it believes Ukraine is storing military assets in these areas. End quote. Quick question. Does this mean that Russia believes Ukraine is storing military assets in the Greek consulate? I mean, it was among the buildings damaged in recent missile strikes on Odessa. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky held a meeting of the Supreme Commander-in-Chief's staff, after which he announced that military and security leadership is considering a response to Russia's attacks on agricultural infrastructure and cultural sites and ways to unblock the Black Sea Grain Corridor. When the Kohovka hydroelectric power plant and dam were destroyed by Russia, the flooding devastated farms and farming infrastructure throughout the region, and officials, experts, and farmers say Ukrainian agriculture could suffer long-term damage. According to the Security Service of Ukraine, called the SBU, Yevhen Murayev, a former leader of the now-banned pro-Russian Nashi party, was charged with high treason for using his media empire to disseminate pro-Russian propaganda. Let's move on to the temporarily occupied territories. The Ukrainian Air Force launched 17 drones at military targets in Crimea, all of which the Russian Ministry of Defense, or MOD, claimed to have shot down. Three destroyed hangars with ammunition near Vilna and a maintenance depot in Novostepova say otherwise, however. The explosions disrupted one of Russia's primary supply lines through the peninsula, and Ukrainian Defense Minister Oleksiy Reznikov said in a recent interview with CNN that Ukraine will continue to attack targets in Russian-occupied Crimea to reduce Russia's fighting capacity and, quote, help save the lives of Ukrainians, end quote. Ukraine's state-owned hydropower generating company Ukrhydroenergo reported on July 24th that the water level at the Dnipro hydroelectric power plant upriver of what used to be the Kohovka Reservoir has dropped to a critical level. The plant requires a water level of 12 to 12.5 meters for full functioning, and it currently sits at 12.05 meters. Ukar Hydroenergo did have some good news, however, noting that the Kohovka hydroelectric power plant might not have to be rebuilt if the technical issues related to the draining of the Kohovka reservoir are resolved. Because the risk of nuclear disaster is Russia's favorite flavor, occupation authorities at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant have transitioned Reactor 4 from cold shutdown to hot shutdown, according to Ukrainian state nuclear energy company Energoatom and the State Nuclear Regulatory Inspectorate. Energoatom stressed that the action is in violation of the power plant's nuclear and radiation safety standards and significantly increases the risk of a nuclear incident. In late July 2022, there was an apparent explosive attack at the Olenivka prison colony in occupied Donetsk, that killed 53 Ukrainian prisoners of war and wounded 75, many from the siege of Mariupol and Azovstal. Russia claimed that the deaths during the Olenivka massacre were caused by a Ukrainian HIMARS strike, despite photo evidence showing structural damage more consistent with incendiary sources inside the building. Volker Turk, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, issued a statement declaring that, quote, while the precise circumstances of the incident on the night of the 28th through 29th of July 2022 remain unclear, the information available and our analysis enable the office to conclude that it was not caused by a HIMARS rocket. End quote. If you're enjoying the episode, please rate us and leave a review on whatever podcast platform you're listening on. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to reach out to us via email at social at borlingen.media. That's B-O-R-L-I-N-G-O-N dot media. Speaking of remaining unclear, 
Let's talk about the Russian Federation and occupied Belarus. New intelligence indicates that Russian president slash dictator Vladimir Putin was, quote, paralyzed and unable to act decisively, end quote, during PMC Wagner leader Yevgeny Prigozhin's baby coup, despite Russian security services, called the FSB, warning at least two to three days in advance that the rebellion was possible. Some people are just natural-born leaders. Military recruitment is going really well for Russia, so well that on July 25th, the Duma, that's the Russian parliament, approved laws raising the maximum conscription age from 27 to 30, increasing the penalty for evading a military medical examination from 3,000 rubles to 25,000 rubles, and banning conscripts from traveling abroad after receiving a military call-up. It's going so well. The 11th PMC Wagner convoy arrived in Belarus, this time with six Chukka armored vehicles. According to the monitoring group Belarusian Hajun, Chukkas are rare and distinctive vehicles used by Wagner that have not previously been observed in the country. Putin and the illegitimate self-declared president of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, have stepped up their information operations against the West, according to the Institute for the Study of War, alleging that the Ukrainian counteroffensive is failing and that Wagner is somehow a threat to Poland. There is no indication that Wagner fighters in Belarus have the heavy weaponry necessary to mount a serious offensive against Ukraine or Poland without significant rearmament, as it was a condition of the putin lukashenko Prigozhin deal ending the armed rebellion that Wagner surrender such weapons to the Russian Ministry of Defense. Wagner forces in Belarus pose no military threat to Poland or Ukraine for that matter, until and unless they are re-equipped with mechanized equipment, end quote. Some assessment here. Even if Wagner were re-equipped and attacking Poland didn't trigger Article 5 with NATO, Poland's military is incredibly professional, equipped with modern Western weaponry and trained to NATO standard. Perhaps most importantly, Poland would have massive air superiority. If Wagner were to cross the border into Poland, they would be wiped out in less time than it took them to capture Rostov back in June. And that's assuming they made it across the border in the first place. Russian media reported a third UAV struck Moscow on Monday, a helicopter-style drone without any explosives. The Russian MOD stated that it used radio-electronic equipment to down the drones, with Kremlin spokespersons both playing down the attack and threatening retaliatory strikes. In response, Ukraine's digital transformation minister Mikhailo Fedorov said that the attacks show that Russia's electronic warfare and air defense systems are, quote, increasingly unable to defend the occupier's sky, end quote, adding that, quote, no matter what happens there, this is going to happen more, end quote. Bellingcat, an investigation firm that has leaned toward pro-Russian narratives in the past, noted that one of the drones downed in the city on the 24th landed near multiple important military facilities. In European news, Lithuania's main port, Klaipeda, could ship 10 million tons of Ukrainian grain, but the logistics of getting the cargo to the Baltic coast remain complicated. The Lithuanian State Defense Council approved a military aid plan for Ukraine worth 220 million U.S. dollars over the next three years, including both lethal and non-lethal aid, military training, and repair of military equipment in Lithuania. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen announced on July 25th that the EU had paid out another 1.5 billion euros, that's about 1.65 billion U.S. dollars, in financial aid to Ukraine under the Macro Financial Assistance Package, an 18 billion euro package that is dispersed monthly. Poland is reportedly demanding that the EU extend the overland grain ban to which President Zelensky responded, quote, Our position is clear. Blocking land exports after September 15th when the relevant restrictions cease to apply is unacceptable in any way. We are in contact with all interested parties to find a solution that will suit everyone. End quote. 
Let's talk about the news worldwide. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said in a recent interview with CNN that Ukraine has succeeded in recapturing roughly half of the territory initially taken by Russia during the invasion, though he emphasized that Ukraine still has a, quote, very hard fight ahead of it and it would take time. Chinese exports of dual-use goods to Russia have increased significantly over the past year, according to Politico, particularly drones and ceramics used in body armor. The imports were reportedly carried out through companies that had been created specifically to conceal trade activities. While some Chinese companies claim to have severed ties with Russia, Politico's investigation suggests they continue to trade with Russia through third parties and shell companies. Russia has been desperately trying to frame its presence in Africa as a diplomatic win, presenting high-profile meetings between Russian and African officials, the Kremlin's promises of new business deals, and Wagner activities across the continent as proof of a strong relationship. In reality, however, Russia's position in Africa is far from strong, and it's getting weaker every day. Russia provides less than 1% of direct foreign investment in Africa, its bombing of grain supplies is enormously unpopular, and polls show that only about a third of Africans have a favorable opinion of Russia. It's almost like people don't like their elections being interfered with, their officials bribed, and their towns and cities filled with Wagner mercenaries. When asked for the Biden administration's response to the drone attack on Moscow, White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre replied, quote, This is a war that Russia started. End quote. Let's talk military tech. Unnamed U.S. officials told the Associated Press that the U.S. will provide Ukraine with a batch of Black Hornet nanodrones used for reconnaissance and intelligence gathering in an aid package worth about 400 million U.S. dollars. The Black Hornet measures 16 centimeters by two and a half centimeters. That's six inches by one inches, U.S. Americans, and legitimately looks like a toy. German company Rheinmetall announced that by the end of the year, it will be providing Ukraine with two Skynex air defense systems equipped with programmable 35 millimeter ahead ammunition. The systems will reportedly be mounted on new Rheinmetall HX 8x8 military trucks. Ukraine has begun mass production of Sirko UAVs capable of tracking down an enemy position at a distance of 65 kilometers. That's the brief for today. Remember to check your sources and don't fall for propaganda. Join us on YouTube and TikTok for more Ukraine content and live news reports. And please consider supporting our work on Patreon. You'll find those links in the description as well. We'll be back tomorrow with more updates. Until then, stay safe, everyone.